Hello, friends, and welcome to Christian Connections Live from Loma Linda, California. This is LLBN TV, and I'm just so glad we can be with you again during this hour. I'd like to welcome my co-host and longtime friend, Marlon Paley, a Thank man you. who's been committed to the ministry for a long, long time. Marlon, I don't know what we would have done without you. Well, you know, it's like a uh, bucket of water. If you put your fist in a bucket of water and you take it out, that's how long it takes for the Holy Spirit to fill the hole. Okay. So he, he assigns us and he moves us around. And what a wonderful God we serve. Amen. Well, I'm glad you put the Holy Spirit equation because you're right. The Holy Spirit will fill it up. But if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, it would be a big void without having you here. Well, it's so. a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. For your kind words. Well, folks, uh, again, it's that time of the day for us to have a deep and detailed conversation about who? Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And today, Marlon, we have a special guest. going to be blessed us during this next hour. Who is he? You want to tell him? <laughs> well, Do you know who he is? <laughs> of course. You know, right? uh, uh, in fact, we have the whole family. But let's, let's start out with uh, Roger Schwelt. Thank you for coming, Doctor. Thank you. And then, uh, well, we have another brother. Uh, oh, there's more. Yes. All right. Uh, his name is Peter Schwelt, and uh, he's at the piano. And then there is another Schwelt. Goodness. With, uh, you know, a longtime friend. In fact, all of these guys are longtime friends of LOBN. Uh, Aaron Schwelt. Uh, That's right. So uh, Craig was going to be here, but, uh, you know, the baby and other things, so. Uh, we just have the three of them here. And they are prepared to deliver praise to God through music and word. And uh, what's the topic uh, for this evening, Gannon? Well, I think Roger would tell us best. But from what I understand, it's about the sanctuary. Yes, it's about the sanctuary and, uh, and time and parallelisms in the Gospels. So whenever you hear about the sanctuary, you think about Old Testament right. kind of Jewish stuff, but um, I, I like to look for patterns, and I found that the, the sanctuary is alive and well, and it's all throughout the New Testament as well. It's also in Revelation. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Well, Marlon, how about we start with music, and then we'll get back into our discussion. Boy, what a blessing it would be. Come on, Aaron. And uh, Peter, uh, they've got a very special song that the, they're going to share with you. It's called Blessing. That's what you are to us at Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Aaron? your love as if 
Praise God. I mean, there's so much talent in that family. Aaron Schwelt, uh, accompanied by uh, our brother-in-law, Peter Schwelt. And, uh, of course, so uh, we have Roger Schwelt right here on set. Uh, and Gab is going to tell us uh, about that. Gab? Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to have the Schwelt family here. Mm -hmm. I have known them almost since the days I started attending University Church back in 80. 87 probably, and I remember the Schwelt brothers were just kids mm -hmm. riding around University Church, and now they're grown up, fine professionals, and speaking the word of God. I mean, that's just, that's just awesome to see young kids to grow to be such fine adults. Well, it speaks volumes for how that you were brought up, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. It does. Um, uh, first of all, the honor is ours to be here. And uh, we, uh, my brother and I actually uh, were involved with Pathfinders at the University Church. And that's how we got involved with television ministry. And that's, again, probably how you got to know us because we were the little kids on the cameras. That's you know? right. We thought that that was fascinating growing up in church and seeing these television cameras and things. We wanted to get involved and, and we did it. Eventually, we got my dad involved too. He was uh, up there in the booth doing the switching. Yeah. And uh, is still involved, still involved with that. My dad is still involved with that. Um, for a while there, we all four of us, uh, all four kids and my dad were involved with the television ministries at, uh, at the university church. Um, as you may know, we would, we would do it every third week. And uh, that presented itself a problem if we ever went on vacation because mm -hmm. uh, you would lose <laughs> half of the crew. <laughs> half the crew. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we had some responsibilities. Well, I think that's great. You know, we talk about discipleship. I think when parents invest spiritually in their children, that is a source of di sort of a discipleship because you are producing disciples within the family. Yeah. You know, discipleship is not always just out in the field or schools or churches to create disciples. We also, as as the head of the families, we produce should be producing disciples from within our homes, and I think that's what I have seen over the years. Your mom and dad has truly produced young disciples out of the Schwelt family. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you for yeah. being here with us today. Um, well, today uh, we're going to be listening to your message about the sanctuary. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, after that we'll get back here and have a discussion about the topic. Yes. Uh, so in a minute or two we'll have you stand up and bless us with your message. Thank you. Uh, why you are focused on the sanctuary today? I mean, I'm sure there are other topics that you're passionate about. I have, um, it's been a, a number of reasons why I think uh, that I've focused on the sanctuary. Uh, as we'll talk about in the, in the sermon, um, if you go to Psalm 77, 13, uh, David, who we all know more than anybody else wanted to build the temple mm -hmm. and uh, he wasn't allowed to do it because he was a man of war. He said, thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. Who is such a great, who is a God is such a great a God as, as thou? And, uh, you know, I, um, I see in everything that God does, he, he uses the sanctuary as a way of affecting change on earth in more ways than you can imagine. And um, in discovering that and studying the Bible, uh, it's become kind of a passion of mine to see parallelisms with the sanctuary. You know, um, as a physician, I'm trained to look for patterns. Mm. I'm trained to look for patterns. If somebody comes in with elevated neck veins, low, lower extremity swelling, um, can't lay flat, that, that's a, a relative pattern of congestive heart failure. Mm. And so I can identify congestive heart failure by, by finding that pattern. And, and in fact, most of medicine is pattern recognition. What I, what I started noticing when I started looking through the Bible was this recurring pattern over and over again. Um, and it was this pattern of, and, and you probably can start to recognize it, but something having to do with a door closing or some sort of a door, and then something that has to do with seven afterwards. Mm. So let, let's, let's go over a couple of things. Um, Daniel and his three, or D Daniel's three friends uh, were uh, asked to bow down to the image. Um, they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and when the door closed, it was seven times hotter. Um, when uh, Noah went into the ark, the door was closed, and he had to wait seven days. Uh, when Jericho was being sieged by uh, Joshua, the door, everything was sealed up, mm -hmm. and what happened? They had to march around mm -hmm. for seven days. And I started noticing this. Um, at, and at every Passover feast, uh, Moses, for instance, at the Passover of in Egypt, Moses told the Israelites to go into their homes uh, on the 14th day, to close their doors, don't come out into the, into the morning, and what happened? You had this feast of, uh, the, the un feast of unleavened bread, which lasts for seven days. And it took them seven days to get to the Red Sea. So I, I started to put this all together. Is it possible, is it possible that these stories that we have in the Bible are snapshots of something much, much bigger that's about to happen? Hmm. Because we know, in, uh, we know in eschatology, Adventist eschatology, what are, what are we looking for? What do we know is going to happen if we look in Revelation? There's going to be a door that closes on humanity. Probation. Probation will close. And then what will follow after that are the seven last plagues. Mm. So is it possible that the, the greatest event that is a, about to occur on Earth's history has been told about multiple times in the Bible mm. from different angles different stories, you, don't, you understand what I'm right, saying? and we're just missing it. And, and we're missing it, yeah, maybe, you know, it's kind of like if you go into a, I don't know, sometimes you open up a car magazine, you really like a car, so let's, a Porsche, okay? Uh, and you look, you see the Porsche from different, mm -hmm. different perspectives, under the hood, from the back, from the side. If you go online to try to buy a car, you'll see it from different perspectives. And it's just giving you a sense of right, what it is, right. but to actually experience it, you go there and you can see it for yourself. And I'm wondering if this is how God works. Interesting. Very interesting insight. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure you're going to help us understand more of your yeah. discoveries. Are you ready for that sermon? Absolutely. Balin, are you ready for it? Yeah, but just before you get started, it reminds me of Ecclesiastes, the whole book. Nothing is new under, under the, sun. the sun. That's correct. You know, is, all is vanity and all... Mm -hmm. It's the same tricks over and over again through the generations. Absolutely. Well said, well said. All right, let's get his podium up here and let's give him the opportunity to share with us his message. Roger Schwelt, our guest for the day. <clears throat> of the first. So as I was talking about, um, let's see if we can get the first slide.
as I was talking about with the the, um, the the period of seven days after the close the close of a door, um, what does that have to do with the sanctuary? Um, well, if you look at the uh, at the sanctuary, imagine that you're in the sanctuary, and you were to measure, take a measuring tape from the, from the front of that door where the altar of incense is, or for, for where the, the altar of, of sacrifice is, and you were to measure in terms of time how long that time would go, um, you would know that from Revelation, or from Daniel chapter 9, I don't think it's working though. Okay, all right. From, and, and we know in Daniel chapter 9 that we have the 70-week prophecy, and that takes us to when Christ died on the cross in the middle of that last 70th week. And we can time exactly when that would have occurred. And that's around AD 31. That's based on 457, which was when Jerusalem was to be rebuilt. And it's a very well-known uh, prophecy. Well, back in Daniel chapter eight, we have the 2300 day prophecy, which starts at the very same time in 457 BC. But that takes us to another veil that is the veil that separates the most holy from the holy. So essentially what we have here is we have prophecies back to back. Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 8 is a prophecy that gets us to the deep veil, the veil there in the, um, in, in the most holy. And Daniel chapter 7, or Daniel chapter 9, gets us to the first veil. So we start with the, um, with the text, Psalm 77, where it says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. I will meditate also on all of thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And it doesn't say that some of his works are in the sanctuary. It says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Let's go with the next slide. And as you can see in the sanctuary, from that first gate, there are two veils. The two veils separate the courtyard from the holy and the holy to the most holy. And so we're going to talk about those two veils today. If we could have the next slide. I think they're having slight, te slight technical difficulties. Okay. No. We'll get um, all right, no problem. The, um, the first the first veil and the second veil are related to each other. What is a veil? A veil is something that prevents you from going into the next place. It doesn't prevent you from going into it, but it prevents you from looking into it. And where I want to go with this is this, this period of the sanctuary. We know that these pieces of furniture in the sanctuary perfectly reflect what happened to Christ as he went through his ministry. So the first part is the altar of sacrifice. This is where Christ died on the cross for us, just like he was the Lamb of God. Then moving to the laver is when you, is, is, has to do with baptism. And so Jesus was buried with him in baptism, and then Jesus was raised, to, to, was raised uh, from the dead. Then we reach the first veil, okay? And on that first veil, Jesus ascends into heaven. And when he ascends into heaven, there are three things that occur, and those are the three pieces of furniture that are in the holy place. So what are the three things? We have the table of showbread, which represents the word of God, which was created after Christ ascended into heaven. Then there was the, the uh, altar of incense, which represents the Holy Spirit, and that represents the Holy Spirit going back to earth as the comforter. And then finally, um, actually that was the seven branch candlestick. And then the altar of incense is where prayers go to ascend. And that was our ability to now go to the right hand of God and ask for forgiveness of sins. But there is one more veil. And that's the veil that separates the holy from the most holy. And that, we said, has to do with 1844, which we all know has to do with the investigative judgment and the mercy seat, importantly, that is in there. So what I want to, so what I want to try to do is, oh, there we go. So let's, let's click through that, and we can go quickly here. Um, you can see that in Psalms 23, David takes us through that. So let's go through that. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And then the laver, he leads me beside the still waters. And then we go into that first veil. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Next is he, leadeth, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table 
the table of showbread. In the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And then finally, in that last veil, surely goodness, the Ten Commandments, and mercy, the mercy seat, shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice the imagery of the altar of sacrifice. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. All right, so remember that. We're going to come back to that. Let's go on to the next slide. So we have type and anti-type. And as we go through type and anti-type, what we're going to show is that as we march through, there's many places in the Bible like this. As we march through, in this case, the Gospel of Mark, we're going to see stories in the Bible, stories in the Bible that actually take us through this period of time and match the period of time that we went from the beginning of Christ's ministry to the present time. And I think this is exciting because if we follow it through in parallel, we will come to stories that have to do with present day. And these stories literally were written for us today. So in Mark 6.34, it says that Jesus saw, we're going to talk about the feeding of the 5,000, which by the way started at the Passover. Mark 6.34 says that Jesus saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And further down in Mark 6.39, he says, And he commanded them to make all of them sit down upon the green grass. So here's that imagery that's being used. Green grass, they're a bunch of flocks without a shepherd. And so we know that that has to do with the altar of of the altar of sacrifice, because we know that in AD 31, Christ, who was the bread of life, led the Jews as a shepherd to relieve their burdens as sheep in green pastures. His death re relieved the world of the burden of guilt and sin. Now, Jesus fed that multitude with five loaves and two fishes. Five loaves, two fishes. Jesus' mission in AD 31 was accomplished by his death on the cross and his burial and resurrection from the tomb. This is symbolized by the altar of sacrifice and the labor, respectively, in the outer court. The altar of sacrifice is five cubits by five cubits. Okay? And Jesus was pierced five places on his body, two in his feet, two in his hands, and one on his head. That was before he, was, before he died. Remember the sixth was in his abdomen, which created blood and water. But remember, he died between two men, two fishes. So we have the five loaves and the two fishes. Christ, Christ commanded the 5,000 to sit down, and they were organized, it says in Mark, in groups and rows of 50 and 100. So if you take 5,000 people, 5,000 men, and put them into a row of 50, how many rows are you, are you going to have? It's simple division. 50, 100 rows. So you had 50 by 100 people. 50 times 100 is 5,000. Well, they were seated exactly in the same way as the outer court because the outer court is 50 cubits by 100 cubits. Okay? So the outer court symbolizes Jesus' work on earth, and this is exactly what he did by feeding the 5,000. He showed them that he was breaking the bread, his body, and giving it to all. Now, Let's read in Desire of Ages, page 368, what happened. After the multitude had been fed, there was an abundance of food left. But he who had the resources of infinite power at his command said, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. The contents of those baskets were distributed among the eager throng, and they were carried away into the region all about. So those who were at the feast were to give others the bread that comes down from heaven to satisfy the hunger of the soul. They were to repeat what they had learned of the wonderful things of God. Nothing was to be lost. Not one word that concerned their eternal salvation was to fall useless to the ground. Now, how many baskets were left over? Twelve baskets were left over. The result of Jesus' ministry was that all were fed with his body with leftover to spare. The good news was so plentiful that it was spread around the world by the use of 12 disciples that fed the spiritually hungry. Now that we have gone through the outer court, we are going to pierce the veil. And with the feeding of the 5,000, we have pierced that veil. What will we expect? We will expect something akin to the early church. 
So Matt, Jesus sent the 12 disciples in a boat on the sea across to their new location. He then went up to a mountain to pray. Matthew 14, 23 says, and he had sent the multitudes away and went up to a mountain to pray. And when the evening was come, he was alone. And we know that in AD 31, Jesus Christ sends the disciples, the church, into the tumultuous sea of the multitudes and went on to plead on behalf of, the, of mankind in the presence of the Father in the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to enter the church. It was known as the Comforter. Now the disciples are in the boat, which represents the early church, on the choppy waters in the midst of the storm. Jesus comes to them in the midst of this turbulence in the appearance of a spirit. On the, on the disciples, when he steps into the boat, the peace that passeth all understanding comes with him. Luke 6, 49 says, but when they saw him walking upon the sea, they were supposed that it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And as he went up to them in the ship, the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure. Now we know we're in the flow of the Gospel of Mark, in the parallel of the early church. So now we read with excitement, well, what happens next? And does it have to do what happened to the early church? Well, that's correct. While Jesus was in heaven, he sent back the Holy Spirit to enter his church. John 14, 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay, so what happens next in the story? What happens next is Jesus and the disciples go across the lake, and in Mark 6, 54, he says, And when they were come out of the ship, and straightway they knew him, and ran through that whole region around about, and began to carry in beds those that were sick, when they heard that he was, and whithsoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets." and besought him that they might touch, if it were, the border of his garment, and as many touched him were made whole. This is the period after AD 31. The gospel message is spread across the then known world, and the people are healed as, as to the gospel message. Well, what's about to happen next? Jesus, on the other side, runs into the Pharisees. He runs into the religious leaders who like to use civil authority to enforce their religious views. The issue of tradition of men and the law of God are raised. And this is exactly what we see in the early church at this time. This correlates exactly with the time period in the early church where many esteemed writers and theologians brought in non-biblical thinking and even the substitution of the Sabbath for Sunday when, the, when it was formalized by Constantine in 321 AD. Listen to what Mark says. Quote, the, this honor, the people honoreth me with their lips. This is Jesus speaking. The people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrines and the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things do you do. And he said unto them, full well ye, the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. This Darkening of light led to a period in Earth's history known as the Dark Ages. The light of the gospel had been shrouded to such a degree that millions were thirsting for fresh water and the good news. So what happens next? We see Jesus going to Tyre and Sidon. These were places that knew not of the gospel. These were places of darkness. And who did he meet? But a woman that needed the devil cast out of her daughter and a man that could neither speak nor hear. Mark 7, 28, 29, and she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For saying this, the devil has gone out of thy daughter. Because of faith, Jesus was going to work his purpose in those Gentiles who lived in darkness and had not the message, but who hungered for it. These places were formerly pagan and barbarian. Yes, Europe, Europe. The Reformation had begun. Jesus used a man who was deaf and could not speak. Imagine using the barbarians of Europe to spread the gospel that had been buried in the Dark Ages. And yet he was healed. Go to Mark 7, 32. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseeched him to put 
his hand upon him, and he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephathapha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, the much more great deal they published it. That's the word that's used in the King James, published it. And we're beyond measure astonished, saying, he had done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. The Reformation was published. Yes, the printing press, Gutenberg's printing press, had just been invented, and Luther's 95 theses spread across the then-known world like the leaves of autumn. The more the Protestants were suppressed and told not to publish, the more the message spread. The gospel was being spoken plainly again, just like this man that Jesus had healed. Where does all of this lead? We lead to another veil. We have just gone through the holy place. We have left the veil of the outer court where Jesus fed the 5,000. And now we have reached another veil in our transposition through the sanctuary. And guess what we come to in the scripture? Not the feeding of the 5,000, but the feeding of the 4,000. Now, what does the four mean in this case? Well, I noticed in the Bible that whenever the number four is used, it refers to a global thing. For instance, the four corners of the land, spoken of in Ezekiel 7-2. The fourth angel spreads the three angels' messages to the whole world, Revelation 18, 1-3. In Jeremiah 49, 36, it says, And I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four quarters of the earth, and I will scatter them to all those winds, and there shall be no nation whose, to which who driven out of Elam shall not come. In Matthew 24, 31, it says, And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one, of the, from one end of heaven to the other. Well, Jesus fed the 4,000 with seven loaves. What does the seven mean? Seven is a complete number in the Bible. Jesus completed his work on the seventh day. They march seven days around Jericho. The number of times that blood is sprinkled in the most holy place is seven times. And so in Mark 8 now, it says, so they did eat and were filled. And they took up the broken meat and that was left in seven baskets. So we have seven loaves feeding the 4,000, leaving seven baskets. The complete message going to the whole world and then the complete message. How is that possible? Well, if we go to, if we go to Revelation 10.10, 10, it says, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as I had eaten it, it was in my belly, it was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Folks, the feeding of the 4,000 relates to 1844. We have the complete message in 1844 going to the whole world, and then it is to be preached again. The seven baskets remained. The seven baskets after seven loaves. The complete message to be given by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This occurs at the inner veil. And in 1844, we know that Christ passed through that inner veil as he went into the most holy place in heaven. The only place where we see that. Now, the next story that happens... It's exciting because now it has to do with our time. And this next story is only recorded in Mark 8, 22. It's the only place in the Bible where it's recorded. It's where a man who could once see was healed in two steps. He was healed, and then he could only see men walking as trees, and then he was healed again. Jesus spat into his eyes again. It was soon after 1844 that God's commandment-keeping people received the gift of prophecy. That gift was allowed, who accepted it, to see spiritual things clearly. It is where we receive the gift of the sanctuary message and the gospel to once again preach to the world. The gift of spiritual vision, because, as it says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Well, after this happens, there is just a few more scenes that occur in this stretch. The next scene in Mark takes place in Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus is telling the disciples what is going to happen next 
and what is expected of them. And I believe this has to do with us today based on where we are in the history of Mark and the sanctuary. Mark 8, 27, whom do men say that I am? And they answer, John the Baptist. But some say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, thou art the Christ. Matthew says that Christ bl said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And further on down in Mark, he says, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the save, same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, so also the Son of Man shall be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. This type of action requires faith given from God. This faith will transform us to believe on Jesus the Savior. This is the message for today. Are we ready to die to self and place our life as a living sacrifice upon the altar? Righteousness by faith. It was this very topic that was the subject of the 1888 General Conference and is still the very issue to this very day. No other topic is as worthy the topic of righteousness by faith. Our rejection of this message in 1888 is the reason why we are still here today. And it's the, it's the acceptance of this message that will give us that much closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, how do I know this? Because what happens next in the story of Mark tells us that we are on the right track. Mark 9, and he says unto them, this is the parallelism. He's talking to them, but he's also talking to us because we're in parallel. Listen to these words. Verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come in power. The very next scene, in fact, is the Mount of Transfiguration the very event that we all wait for, where Elijah and Moses, representing the 144,000 and the dead in Christ, are standing next to him. Some will say, you know what? You're reading too much with these numbers in the Bible. What did Jesus say about these two stories? Do you know what Jesus said about these two stories, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000? Let me read you Mark 8, 14 to 21, and then we will close. Now, the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither they had in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And as they reason among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not, neither understand? Have you heard, heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? Having ears, hear ye not? Do you not remember? When I break the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did I take up? And they said unto him, 12. And then he says, and then when the seven among the 4,000, how many basket full of fragments there? And they said, seven. And he said unto them, how is it that you don't understand? Folks, let us strive to understand. Psalm 77, 13. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Amen. Thank you. Very interesting. <laughs> We're going to discuss more some of the topics you covered, but let's take a music break, Marlon. Tell us what we have next. Well, we've got Aaron and Peter Schwell <laughs> uh, up next with one of your favorites. And if it isn't your favorite, well, it's going to be your favorite after Aaron sings this song. Now, what is the title? The Savior is Waiting. Uh, kind of apropos to what uh, Roger was talking about. So listen to these words. Listen to the beautiful music. Praise Jesus Christ for all his glory and wonderfulness. And I'll be right back to Dr. Roger. Aaron. Keep you. Up. 
If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart he'll abide. beautiful sentiment and uh, boy she does that quite well doesn't she I think you would agree Roger yeah now, you've heard her sing a lot yes <laughs> does she ever sing at churches oh all, all the time yeah so if you'd uh, like to have Aaron and uh, Peter or Craig maybe even Roger come to your church uh, just to get a hold of JU's here at the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Call, write, or uh, send an email uh, to the address on the screen. Well, Gannon, just start us off. Well, I just want to say something quick about Aaron. Aaron started with us in the very early days of LLVN. She was quite involved until she got married and got a more complicated job. As a kid. Had kid, right? But she's back, and thank God for her return to LLBN because she's always been a blessing to the family of LLBN here in our studios as well as to our viewers. Well, I'm going to come back to, <laughs> I have a question and then I'll let Marlon dive in. Uh, but so very insightful, very interesting how you illustrated the numbers and the parallels here. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is not a fair question, but I'll ask and you can if you can't answer it, we'll move on to the next topic. Sure. But where does all the significance of numbers leads to forward in our times? I think that uh, if you're talking about numbers that are used in the Bible, I think they define themselves. Um, uh, and I believe the way that God uses numbers in the Bible is to connect thoughts, to say this is connected to this. Um, for instance, the... Uh, we've talked about Esther before. Um, we know that the Jews were sold for 10,000 talents of silver. Well, there's a whole other parallel in Matthew chapter 18 where Christ gives the, the parable of the king, the servant, and the fellow servant. Well, in that story, the, the servant owes the king exactly the same amount of money, 10,000 talents. And, um, and, if, and we could go through that, um, not today, but that connects those two thoughts. That's a way of God saying that those are connected. I, I brought up the number five. Whenever the number five or a multiple of five is used in the Bible, I see the, the, the idea or the principle of grace. For instance, uh, the altar of sacrifice was five cubits by five cubits. When Abraham was pleading for Lot and for those that would be righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, he started at 50 and, his, and when he started to work down, he worked down by, by fives or mm -hmm. by multiples of five. Um, when Christ healed the man at the pool of, of Bethesda, um, he didn't even ask him for faith. He just said, do you want to be healed? He said, yes, he healed him. And, and they just throw these little details in there of, oh, by the way, there were five porticos over the pool of Bethesda. Mm -hmm. So you, you start mm -hmm. to see that, that things that are just thrown in for color are not really there for color. They're mm. actually there for a, for a purpose. And I could go on. I mean, when at Simon's feast, when Christ is sitting at the table and he compares what Simon has done and what Mary Magdalene has done, you know, uh, about the person who owed 500 and the one that owed 50, and they were both forgiven. Why did God choose 550? Mm. It's because every single time the number five is brought up, it has to do with grace. 
You know, I think about taking nothing for granted. When, when that nail went into Christ's hands, how many fingers were there? Five. There were five. Mm. It didn't have to be that way. Christ created us with five fingers. Why? I, and Christ knows the beginning from the end. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And I just can't imagine just the significance and the irony of all of those things. He was pierced in five places, sixth after he died. Um, and the five goes on, and not just the number five. We could go on to the number eight, or we could talk about the number seven. You know, it's interesting that there's 12 disciples, and those <laughs> replaced the 12 tribes. That's right. So, I mean, people, yeah. uh, sometimes people get a little bit afraid of talking about numbers in the Bible because, you know, there's other religions, even, you know, satanic religions that look at numbers very importantly. But again, Satan copies mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And so I think these numbers uh, do have meaning, but we should be careful not to assign meaning to the numbers. We should let the Bible describe what those, what those meanings are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mala. Very interesting. I'd like to talk about the number 12 uh, in depth because that's really uh, uh, a special number. You mentioned the disciples. Yeah. You know, 12 times 12 is 140. 140 that's the fruit of the disciples, you know, right. uh, after, uh, with the work of the Holy Spirit as, as they uh, uh, very fascinating. And I'm like you. Uh, I don't want to get hung up on the numbers. Yeah. But I realize that they're very significant because a, our God is a God of numbers. Correct. You know, we, we have the laws of the universe that keep the planets, you know, on their trajectories. And uh, we have the, the laws of gravity that keep everything stuck to the ground. And, you know, yeah. all of that is the various mathematical uh, uh, formulations. But I have to ask you this question. I mean, are you a doctor or are you uh, a preacher? Uh, I'm a doctor. <laughs> well, you know, those are actually the same because uh, the Latin for doctor is teacher. I mean, doctrines are teachings. That's right. And a doctor is a teacher. So uh, we've, I've, I think we've kind of misused the word doctor. And my dad is a doctor, but he's a dentist, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he's a doctor of dental surgery. Um, a doctor is someone who teaches. And, and I think that's, yeah. we've, we've kind of compartmentalized in modern speak you know, you, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do. I, I, I think back to a time when we had Renaissance men, Renaissance men and women mm -hmm. that dabbled in everything. You know that... Uh, Name one. Sir Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. very well known for Newtonian physics. Do you know he actually wrote more about prophecy and the Bible than he did That's about right. physics? And he's pretty right on. He was. And, and he actually was very on, yeah. Um, in his writings. But, yeah. you know, this... This is all, like you said, uh, in Anchor, and uh, we were talking about Ecclesiastes, nothing's new under the sun, yes. and the sanctuary has come from the, the Me Medi East. It's a copy of the one in heaven. Correct. You know, Jesus is right now, uh, in, a, in some believe, some say, the final phases of the intercession mm -hmm. uh, for the world, and uh, what's next? Well, what's next? Um, it's it's a, I, we. <laughs> what's next is um, well, if you I could I could go into a whole thing about what's next. No, we've got about four minutes. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> um, what's next is that we, as Christians, I believe, need to concentrate fully on what the sacrifice that God did for us on the cross, because is because. What we need to become is righteous. And the Bible does not preach righteousness by works. So when you say, what is it that we need to do? There's nothing that we can do to become righteous. What we need to do is we need to have faith because it is faith that be makes us righteous. I'll give, you, I'll give you an analogy very quickly. In the upper room, right before the Passover feast that Jesus gave at the Last Supper, he he did foot washing. And right before that time, all of the disciples were arguing with each other, kind of like what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. Not us, but in the world. Everyone's at each other's throats. This is what the disciples were doing. They wanted to be number one in the kingdom. James and John had their mother try to get them the top positions. Jesus was very disappointed in that because he was about to die. He knew it, and this is the people that were going to take the message on into the next millennium. All he did was he got up, and acted the part of a servant and washed their feet. And what, what, what it was that made them righteous, because at, at, the at the end of washing their feet, he declared that they were all clean except for one of them. 
Did he not wash that other person's feet? He did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He washed all of their feet. The difference in that made them clean was in their mind. The 11 of them knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And the fact that he had stooped so low to, to take on a task that was reserved only for servants made them realize in their heart how ashamed they would be and how ashamed they were. And that caused them to reflect and see their actions for what they were. Judas, on the other hand, did not believe that such a man as Jesus, if he were the Son of God, if he were the Messiah, there's no way he would have stooped down to wash my feet. And so what made the 11 righteous and the one not righteous was nothing about what Jesus did to them, was nothing about what they did, it was what was in their minds. And it was the faith that they had. Yeah. Is this the Son of God, is this not the Son of God? Well, you're seeing really, it's, it, we have the choice. Yeah. And we make the choice. Right. Uh, time to, to wrap it up. Uh, I'd like you to uh, tell us why is the sanctuary important in this day and age? I believe that the sanctuary is the key that God gave the Christian church to unlock the understanding of the Bible for this time and age, just as the cross was the key to understanding what should have been happening on the road to Emmaus. These disciples walking on the road to Emmaus did not understand what was happening in their age because they did not understand the cross, the first veil. The, the Christians in this era, for them to fully understand what is necessary for them unto salvation here and now, need to understand the sanctuary message in its fullest context for them to be able to, to understand where we are. And, and, and just as it was necessary, just as the Jews rejected the cross and were left in darkness, those that reject the sanctuary are at the same, are, are in the same peril. Yeah, thank you for that. Ganem, uh, I'm gonna give you the last word. Uh, anything uh, more? Very interesting, very fascinating. We'll almost need a whole nother hour to Invite carry on this conversation, <laughs> and that we will. Yeah. Marlon, do you think we have time for one more song? I'm afraid we don't. We don't. The, the song is longer than the okay. time that we have left. Are you going to sing one for us? <laughs> no? No, no, unless you have like you know, a two, two and a half minute song, Aaron. No. no. I would just want to say about Aaron and, and Peter. Um, she does you know, I grew up listening to Peter play the piano, and it's, it's been a blessing. I almost think that, that God sort of made the, the, the auto parts separately, and now we're just putting them together. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just seems like everything has just come together. Well, they're, they're, it fits together yeah. like a hand in glove. I That's mean, right. what a beautiful combination. Yeah. Yes. Um, again, thank you for your presence with us, and we're certainly happy back, because I think our viewers are going to have a lot more questions okay. than maybe we can answer, <laughs> and what's best to bring you back and have you answer some more of those questions they may have as we receive the mail in the next few weeks and Absolutely. see what questions they have. Um, have you ever done series on this topic beyond just today's discussion? Not yet, but I'm, I'm planning on doing it. Actually, um, I have I've been invited to go to India and, uh, and to give a, a presentation along these lines, and that is uh, yet to be in the future, but I'd love to come back and talk about how that went. Right, right. And you foresee yourself continuing this research, oh, yes, th this yes. exploration. Absolutely, there's so much. We'll be studying this for eternity. What's a final message or thought you have not had a chance to share today that you want to share with our viewers? If there's one, you don't have to. I would say uh, if there's one thing that's the most important is, is kind of what I kind of said in the, in the sermon, which is study righteousness by faith. That is, that is, the, that is, the, central, that is the third angel's message and is the central aspect and I believe that the sanctuary will help us understand that better. And for those who are joining us or new yes. in, in faith, what does that mean to them? Righteousness by faith. Look at Abraham. Abraham had faith, and it says there in Genesis, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. So it is, it is the idea that, let me explain it this way real quick. If you get pulled over by the cop mm -hmm. and he writes out the ticket, and he gives, instead of giving you the ticket, he takes the ticket. Are you going to peel out of that? Are you going to peel out after he lets you go and do 90 miles an hour? You're going to want to know what the speed limit is because you're going to want to make sure you're nowhere near that speed limit. And this is what happens when the true Christian understands what Christ did on the cross. 
It's not gonna be what do I need to do and not have to count it sin, and I can get as close to it as possible. It's gonna be where is sin so I can get as far away from that as possible. That's a natural response. And when you have that natural response, it, righteousness becomes natural. And that's the only way to do it. You can't work at it. You can't, you, you can't try to be righteous. You can't try not to do things. The thing from which all blessings flow and all of this flows is by understanding the nature of what Christ did on the cross. And that is righteousness by faith. So nothing possible without going through Christ. That's right. The, the essence of all this. Marlon, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think, you know, Hebrews 11.1 1 is exactly what you're, yeah. you're talking about. Right. You know, faith is what? The substance of things not seen. Yes. You know, things not felt, not heard, not tasted, but yet it's the evidence right. of what? It's, it's the evidence of belief. Yeah, you know, it's the evidence of God's yeah. um, uh, ability to lead us yeah. into his kingdom. And Correct. that's what we have to do. Uh, faith leads to trust. Correct. And trust is also an element that, you know, we need to develop in our relationship. It's all about having a relationship, Ganem. That's right. Listen, you can't have a relationship with Jesus and not have it with his children. And you cannot have a relationship with your children without having a relationship with Jesus. Right. The two are inseparable. You love the Lord. You love all those who he created. And you treat them with passion and grace and, and mercy, just as he does for us. Right. So, uh, uh, well said, Marlon. Well said, uh, uh, Dr. Schwalt. Thank you both for taking the time to be with us today. And fortunately, this is about all the time we have left. We want to thank our viewers for joining us today. Uh, this program will repeat. You need to visit our website at www.llbntv for TV schedule and for repeated times. Of course, uh, uh, it will also be available on our web as a VOD, video on demand, by next week. So you can access it at your own convenient time and not necessarily have to wait for the replay. Thank you, gentlemen, again, and thank you, folks. May the Lord bless you richly as you have blessed this ministry and the viewers of this ministry through your prayers and givings. We'll see you next week.